going to start off talking this morning about a, a very happy topic, <laughs> not necessarily, at least, it's, at least we're not starting a genocide in the morning, uh, but, uh, but we are going to talk about uh, Stalinism, um, and, and, and the attempt to transform the Soviet Union into something very, very different. Uh, but to start off, I want to ask you, I mean, when you think of Stalin or Stalinism, what, what do you associate with that? Do you have any associations? Ideas what when someone mentions Stalin or Stalinism, what, what comes to mind? Violence. Violence, okay. Anything else? Totalitarian state. Totalitarian state, okay. Yes, it's certainly a very, uh, a very kind of powerful image of, of, of the Stalin Soviet Union, totalitarianism. Anything else? Oppression. Oppression, okay. Yes, absolutely. Industrialization. Industrialization, okay. Yeah, that's another very important aspect of Stalin, one that we've been talking about quite a lot this morning. Anything else? The Great Purge. The Great Purge, okay. Or the Great, or the great Purge or Great Terror, as it's sometimes called. That's another very important aspect of, of Stalin. Well, those are all excellent answers and all things we're going to talk about today. Um, what I like, what I want to stress in my talk today, and what I hope you can take away from this, and from thinking about your own teaching, is I like to stress to students that Stalinism was not a one-dimensional phenomenon. It is not all about terror. It is not all about violence. Although terror and violence were integral parts of of this system, there was far more to Stalinism than just that. Indeed, it was an entire attempt to create a new society, a new economic system, a new political system, something entirely uh, novel and new, new on Earth was the intention anyway. Indeed, historian Stephen Kotkin in the 1990s made a lot of waves by suggesting that Stalinism was a civilization with all that entails, that it was an alternative, an attempt to create an alternative way of life uh, to, to the way things were in the capitalist West. I, I really like the idea of treating Stalinism as a civilization, because it leads to more interesting questions than just talking about you know, why is this system evil, what, you know, the destruction that it caused. It leads to more interesting historical questions, like you know, how did the attempt to create the world's freest, most equitable society result in a society where terror became ubiquitous? Uh, how did ordinary people live? And survive under the system because people did live and survive under the system. Um, and I think the most interesting question of all for me is how did this system, where terror was ubiquitous, where state control was ubiquitous, where the one party state generates such genuine enthusiasm among many members of its population? That I think is a, is a very powerful question to pose to students. And if you approach Stalinism as a civilization, I think you can approach answering that question. So today we're going to talk about this new Stalinist civilization through some lectures, some discussion. I will try to keep my remarks this morning as brief as possible, but you know, I mean, we'll probably ramble on quite a lot. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I want to invite you, we're, we're going to have a Q&A session directly following, but I, I do want to invite you, if you have any questions as I go, to please just raise your hand, and I'm more than happy to, to answer that way. All right, so, the Stalin Revolution, which was at its most intense from 1929 to 1932, was probably, arguably, the most radical attempt by any regime in the history of the world to remake its own society, okay? to try to totally, utterly transform it. Uh, and this was the revolution that, in a sense, created the Stalinist system. Right, created what we know as Stalinism. But what's interesting about the Stalin revolution and the Stalinist system that was created is not just what was intended. Because you know, Stalin and his advisors had very <coughs> concrete ideas about what they thought the Soviet Union was going to look like when they were done. But the fact is, um, despite their, certainly their totalitarian aspirations, their desire to control all parts of society, they could not do. And so the Stalin Revolution had many intended, but also very many unintended consequences that shaped the way this new society would be. So 
To start off, why a revolution? Why a revolution from above to remake society? Well, you know, the simple answer, certainly, is to say, well, Stalin is the answer to that question. Why? Stalin decided he wanted to do this, A, and B, he had the power to do it, having made himself dictator of the Soviet Union. And this is certainly true. Both of those things are true. He wanted the revolution and he had the power to do it. But those answers don't really get at the important questions about the Stalin Revolution. They don't explain the timing of the Stalin Revolution, why it happened when it did. It also doesn't explain the content, what the revolution was, what they attempted to do. So to, to kind of get a feeling of that, we need to get more backstory, a little more broader understanding. Now, why is Stalin Revolution? You know, the Bolsheviks, or communists, as they became known in the 1920s, you know, had a vision, had an idea of transforming Russia, the Russian Empire, into the world's first socialist state. And when they took power in 1917, it seemed like everything was going to go very, very smoothly for them. They took power very easily. There was a power vacuum. The Tsarist regime had collapsed in, in, during wartime. The Bolsheviks were very popular uh, in 1917 over a lot of the country, and so they, they had very little trouble taking power. But keeping power and transforming their country into the so ideal social society that they imagined was a lot more complicated than that. Holding on to power was definitely a challenge. They fought a bloody civil war from 1918 to 1922, where um, various political forces who were opposed to them uh, mobilized against the government and fought against them, not to mention scores of foreign countries, including the United States, uh, who intervened in the civil war to try to destroy the Bolshevik Revolution. They came through this. They survived. They won the civil war, but at great, great cost. Um, the country was, by the middle of the 1920s, was an absolute shambles. Uh, any industry that had been built before World War I was more or less closed, shut down, or destroyed. The cities had been rapidly depopulated, so it's a very, very peasant country. Um, and the Soviets, you know, that, that was not their, obviously not their intention, not the kind of country that they wanted to rule. For most of the 20s, they instituted something called the New Economic Policy, or NEP, as it's often called which was essentially a limited return of private capitalism. That is, they, they allowed some private property, some private capitalism, in order to kind of revive the economy, get it back on its feet, get, get Russia moving forward, get the, the Soviet Union's industrial potential realized. But this was very unsatisfying and deeply troubling for most Bolsheviks, for most communist leaders. Uh, there were great anxieties about this. I mean, think about it. You're a socialist. You're, you're a member of the Bolshevik Party. You believe in creating a society of absolute equality where private property is non-existent, and yet you're allowing capitalism, some capitalism, in your own country. It made people deeply, deeply troubled. So that's, that's a big reason behind the Stalin Revolution. It was, it was essentially an attempt to kind of reverse this, what many saw as a drift towards capitalism, to, to seize control and, and, and truly transform the Soviet Union into a socialist country. Stalin certainly shared those kinds of anxieties. But there were another set of anxieties that were probably equally important in creating the Stalin Revolution, and that is the anxieties about war. In the 1920s, Soviet leaders, Stalin, uh, certainly above all others, believed that the Soviet Union was encircled by capitalist enemies intent on the country's destruction. That at the first sign of war, the first opportunity would wipe it off the map. And in, in a sense, Stalin was right. Uh, the Soviet Union had few friends in the 1920s. It was, it had, was hardly even recognized by many countries. Um, and so, so you know, Stalin talked constantly about kind of capitalist encirclement, a jungle law of capitalism, that if, that if the Soviet Union did not modernize, did not industrialize, would be destroyed. Okay, so these are really the two most important preconditions. One, anxieties about the creeping return of capitalism, but second, also this threat of war, which they felt was very real in the 1920s, and would become even more intensive in the 1920s. And so Stalin, in 1929, launched what he called the Great Break, which was essentially the Stalin Revolution. But what did this involve? This was a revolution from above that involved two big components. The first was collectivization. That is, 
transformation of all agriculture in the Soviet Union from private ownership and private farms to some, some kind of socialist collective farms. What those were going to look like was yet to be determined. The second component, the more important one, for Stalin certainly, was industrialization. That is, the Soviet Union underwent a very rapid program of, of, of industrialization to bring it out of backwardness into uh, to being one of the great industrial powers of the world. Uh, the two components were closely related in the minds of Soviet leaders. Why? Because how are you going to pay for industrialization? You pay for it with collectivization, by modernizing agriculture. Because the Soviet Union wasn't going to be able to go out and get foreign loans, right, in order to pay for its industrialization. It, was, it didn't have a limited option on how to pay for it, and so collectivization was seen as the way. All right, so collectivization, in theory, we'll talk about it in theory first, because of course theory and practice in the Soviet, like everywhere, but certainly in the Soviet case, often differed from each other. So in theory, all right, in theory, collectivization was intended to revolutionize agriculture, bring the Russian peasant and other kinds of other peasants out of backwardness, out of, out of the, their old ways of farming that were very traditional, um, small farms, a little mechanization, bring them into the 20th century with modern farming techniques. They would have bigger farms to make use of economies of scale. To make agriculture much more productive, but also mechanized farms. Uh, the Soviet government was going to provide tractors, right, and other kinds of mechanized farm, me uh, implements of mechanization to allow farming to be much more productive. So this this was a big part of the theory. This is what would make it more profitable. But also, the farms were going to be collective. Yeah, they were going to be called they were going to be called the kolkhoz or collective farms. That is, these were going to become socialist farms where. People would share in the labor and share in the fruits of their labor, and there would be equality and no class in the village. Okay, so this, so again, uh, kind of marrying together ideas about modernization, but also about socialism, about creating this true socialist society. Okay, so equality and shared ownership being part of this. Now this is collectivization in theory, right? And when I talk about collectivization in theory, I love to use this particular propaganda poster from the 1920s. Um, in teaching the Soviet, in teaching Stalinism, you have a great opportunity to use, to use all kinds of propaganda posters um, and ask the students kind of to interpret them and what, what they think. This is one of my favorite things to do in class. So this is this is a poster that says, you know, come comrade, join us on the collective farm. Um, what what does this image depict? How does it how does it try to convince people of, 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 to join We're the collective farm? They're happy. They have nice teeth. They're happy and have nice teeth, yeah. I like, to, I like to point that out to students. You know, no Russian peasant had teeth that looked like that. Okay, yeah, they're happy. What else? They're young. It sounds like a party or something. Yeah, they're, they're young. It's like a lot of fun, right? Yay, collectivization, it'll be fun. Um, what else? Anything else? Yeah, I guess it's attractive. Right, there's a man driving a tractor, so it's the mechanized future here on display. So all of these things inviting people to, to come join the collective farm. And indeed, the idea was, in principle, they were just going to convince people to join collective farms, because they were going to be so much better than the traditional ways of farming. Now, in reality, of course, <laughs> things went a little bit differently. Um, you know, Russian peasants, Soviet peasants, like peasants anywhere, were very conservative. They didn't want to change. They certainly didn't want the government coming in and telling them what to do. Um, and so, you know, few people volunteered, to put it, to put it mildly. Um, just to give you a perhaps a useless fact, in 1928, 3% of all the farms in the Soviet Union were collected. So that's voluntary. So 3%. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty low number, right? So what was the government to do? Well, um, in 1929, Stalin was not one for being patient, he launched an all-out drive to collect the farms. He announced in, in the fall of that year uh, that, uh, in November actually, that there would be an all-out drive to collectivize agriculture. That by the spring of 1930, that is in a few, in only a few months, all peasants in the Soviet Union would be joining collective farms. Okay, so all of them. 
Now, so the goal was fantastically hot. It was, you know, very, very hot. This goal of getting all the joint collector frogs. But the details were totally unspecified. This was one of Stalin's favorite uh, modus operandi. He, he would give these fantastical goals, he wouldn't tell anyone how, how, how they're supposed to accomplish it. No details whatsoever how to do it. Just go out and do it. Make, get all the peasants to join collector farms. So, what were regional and local leaders to do? They turned to coercion, more or less, uh, was, was, was the order of business. If you were going to get people to join that quickly, you had to coerce them to do so. And so they told people they had to. Um, and if they didn't, well, they had them arrested, more or less. Um, the, the results of collectivization um, were in many ways, well, were, were, were typical of, of, of the Soviet, of, of Stalinism. On paper, they seemed to be fantastically successful. By, ne by February 1930, 50% of all the peasants in the Soviet Union were in collective farms, which was, you know, well short of Stalin's goal of everyone, but still pretty amazing, right? 50% in three months. That looks great, doesn't it? And they could all pat themselves on the back that they had done a particularly good job. But the reality of this was that there was, in fact, a war going on in the country. A war on the peasantry. Okay, a war by the government against its own peasants. They sent soldiers, they sent uh, volunteers from cities to go out and collectivize agriculture. And it was violent. There is absolutely no question about it. It was indeed verging at times on civil war, one might call it. Um, particularly, uh, a group of people called kulaks were targeted. Does anybody know what a kulak was? <coughs> Somebody they uh, deemed to be a wealthy farmer. Yeah, someone they deemed to be a wealthy farmer peasant, right? The, the, the important phrase here is deemed, right? Because you know, kulak was a very was a notoriously slippery term. What did it mean? What was a rich peasant? I don't know. How do you measure it? Is it because you have one horse, two horses, five cows? Is it because you would you employ hired labor? I mean, so it was a very fuzzy term. And you know, this this was used to the advantage of the authorities, certainly, right? Like, so they could simply, you don't like someone, ah, they're a kulak. So round them up. Uh, but not, but it wasn't just the government that used it, by the way. Villagers, you know, Russian peasants, very smart, very devious, you know. They had people in their villages they didn't like, they had them declared kulaks. The government would do their work for them and get rid of them, okay? But this is a very, very violent process. Um, if you were, if you were uh, labeled as a kulak, uh, you were, in virtually all cases, um, deprived of your home, all of your property, and in many cases, deported elsewhere along with your family. Sometimes arrested, also. Um, so, to give you some idea of the scale of this, in 1930 and 1931 alone, 1.8 million of these so-called kulaks and their families were deported to Siberia and the far north. I'm not going to get into this in too much detail, but the conditions where they were deported to were not exactly ideal. They were more or less dropped off in the middle of nowhere and said, okay, build yourselves a village and survive. So, and many of them did as, as resourceful peasants, but many of them did not. There was open resistance by many peasants. Um, because, like I said, this was, this was a war. There was, there was murder in the protests. There were open demonstrations and protests. Um, well, often resistance was not so direct. It was, it was a little more hidden. Um, people simply didn't cooperate. They didn't work very hard. Um, the kind of traditional kind of techniques of resistance. Probably the most important form of resistance was flight. That is, over 10 million peasants left the villages. Rather than, rather than be part of the collective farms, they left and went into the city. Which is something that we'll be talking about more later. And this collectivization effort caused famine, or was one of the most important factors in bringing about a famine in 1932 and 1933, in which several million people died. Uh, partly because, well, I won't get into the exact causes, certainly, but the fact that the government had you know, totally disrupted agriculture and, and driven out the best people certainly did not have a good effect on, on, on harvest for the next several years. Now, the regime considered collectivization to be a success, at least publicly. Um, for all of its problems, for all of its violence, uh, Stalin 
belief that we have achieved the key goal that he really wanted out of collectivization. That is, he had uh, brought the peasants under the control of the state. Rather than deal with 25 million individual peasant farmers, he could now deal with, uh, make sure I get this number right, 250,000 collective farms, which were all run by managers. So, so the state was able to, to, to kind of dictate a level of control and ability um, that was never previously before possible. So, you know, the extension of what might call totalitarian control, at least in theory. The theory is they had totalitarian control. The practice was um, they had little control over the peasants at all, actually, uh, because the peasants, uh, the, the reality of it was uh, they destroyed Russian agriculture, they destroyed Soviet agriculture. Farms would never be productive. Nobody worked very hard. Um, and so the harvests were never what the regime wanted or expected. And in fact, the only thing successful about collectivization, really, was that they allowed the farmers to keep small private plots on their land. And on those private plots, the, 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 the peasants could grow whatever food they wanted and sell it on, on private market. And those private plots fed the Soviet Union, more or less, because they were so much more productive than any of the other land because the peasants were actually interested in, in, tr in trying to farm them intensively. So in any case, collectivization would then lead into industrialization. It's having dealt with the peasants, having put them into collective farms, having been able to squeeze as much out of it as possible, would pay for this, this key component of rapidly industrializing the Soviet Union, which was, which was really what Stalin was interested in. It was no less than an attempt to bring the Soviet Union from being a third-rate, backwards country into being a world power, uh, all along the lines of the United States and Great Britain and France and Germany. Industrialization was deemed necessary really for, for a pair of reasons. I mean, first of all, you know, you wanted to, it was an attempt to create a socialist society. Socialist society had to be industrial. That's what Marx said. That's what Marx wrote about it. You know, he talked about workers and, and the proletariat. So if, if the Soviets were going to have a socialist country, they had to have a working class. They had to have factories. They had to be industrial. That was a part of it. But also, they, were, they wanted to prepare for a war. Right? If they were going to successfully defend themselves from capitalist encirclement, they had to arm themselves. They had to industrialize rapidly, otherwise they would be destroyed. And that's, you know, that's a, that's a, that is, that is a, it is a realistic assessment. So it had to be, it was going to be rapid, right? This, this revolution for above was going to be rapid. It was going to be the most rapid industrialization in the history of the world. That was one major component of it, right? It was going to be very quick and very fast. And you get a sense from the John Scott reading of just how quickly things are moving, constantly. Um, it was also going to focus almost entirely on heavy industry, right? The Soviets were not interested in making shoes or clothing so much. I mean, they made some of them because they felt they had to, but they were interested in heavy industry, right? They wanted tractors, they wanted tanks, they wanted airplanes, they wanted weapons because they were prepared for war. So they were going to focus almost entirely on heavy industry. So that was a second distinctive aspect of Soviet industrialization. A third was that it was going to be centrally planned. That is, Soviet industrialization, Stalinist industrialization, was going to be planned by central government agencies. Now, why do you suppose they would have chosen to plan, to have a planned industrialization, planned central, rather than letting the market, say, dictate how industrialization would work, which was how it was done in the capitalist West? Anyone have any ideas? More efficient with the resources. Yes, they believed it would be more efficient, right? He is, you know, capitalism is wasteful in many ways, right? Maybe there's overproduction of some things, underproduction of others, there are boom and bust cycles, you know, it's, this, this idea was that a rationally, scientifically planned industrialization will be much more efficient. Now, the reality was, was anything but. But in any case, this was the idea, right? And of course, there's another important context to remember here. I mean, it wasn't just the Soviets who, who were thinking right at this moment that central planning was better for the economy. It was, this was a widespread, widely held belief. Anyone know why? What was going on in 1929? 
the Great, Great Depression, Depression. The Great Depression was beginning, right? So capitalism, you know, the market fund economy was not looking very good. And so the Soviets were really part of a wave of people who, who, were believe, who believed that, that more central planning would be more efficient for the economy. Now, um, so they came up with something called a five-year plan, right? I'm sure you've all heard. The idea was that, you know, okay, the government bureaucracy is going to sit down and figure out a plan that has all the, the, all the inputs and outputs for five years. Figure out how to, how to optimize production of everything, all the inputs and outputs for five years, and you'll have this wonderful industrialization that will be very, very rapid, right? Um, that, will, that will take place from 1929 to 1933, this five-year plan. Those dates are important. Five years, important to tell you the thing. Um, but very quickly began to see that the, that the planning was not so scientific and rational after all. First of all, they didn't make one plan, they made two. One plan that was had lower targets, and then a more ambitious plan that had higher targets. Okay? So obviously politics and pressure are beginning to play some role, but it's clearly not totally scientifically planned. And then, of course, you know, as these plans are being made, you see the Soviet version of pork barrel politics playing out. Uh, playing out. Like just in the same way that members of Congress or senators you know, get projects for their constituents, right? Which may not be good or rational for the country, but create jobs in their own region, or they create investment in their own region. Soviet regional leaders did exactly the same thing. And they competed with each other. So the party boss in Ukraine would say, we want to build the largest steel factory in the Soviet Union. And we will do it in four years for this amount, this number of rubles. And then party boss in another region will say, wait a second, we, we can build that plant. It'll be bigger, and we'll build it faster, and we'll do it much more cheaper. Okay, so they began to compete with each other. And all of this drives the targets for the plans up and up and up. And Stalin and his advisors are sitting in the middle just smiling and watching happily as, as, their, as their plans get bigger and bigger and more ambitious, right? Okay? And you know, just to get a sense of the kind of spirit of, in which this planning was done, I got this particular poster, which I was maybe the most boring slogan, um, but with the strength of millions of workers engaged in socialist competition, we will turn the five-year plan into a four-year plan. Now, what's wrong with this from a rational planning perspective? Sorry. It's yes, it's it's unrealistic. And it, it, it violates the very principles of planning, right? Because if you've optimally allocated all of your resources so that you will build as much as possible in five years, how can you possibly do it in four? Right? It, it makes no logical sense. But this is the spirit in which the planning is done. And indeed, you know, this is not a planned economy that happened to places of, that, that was created in the Soviet Union. It was a command economy. There were targets. And there were commands and there were orders about how things were to be done, but it really wasn't planned in any in any kind of rational form. Okay, um, there was constant political interference, constant interference to push the targets up, to have people do things more quickly and more cheaply. And certainly, it, it totally defeated the purpose of any kind of rational <laughs> planning. Um, to give you an example of the kind of effects of this of this kind of quote-unquote planning, this kind of command economy. Give you the example of the Stalingrad tractor factory. An ordinary Soviet factory that opened in 1930. Okay? It opened in June 1930 and was supposed to be able to produce 500 tractors per month. Okay? In fact, when it opened in June, eight tractors rolled off the assembly line of this finished factory. Okay? Zero in July, 10 in August, and 25 in September. And this was not the worst of it. All of those tractors that had been produced all fell apart within the first 70 hours of operation. Okay? So this is what the result of this kind of command economy does. It leads to, to you know, incredibly shoddy workmanship, constant breakdown, something that you know, I think you certainly see in the John Scott All right, so results. Well, in 1935, as the Kind of Stalin revolution wound down, Stalin gave a famous speech that is often quoted where he, where he said, he uttered the phrase, life has improved, comrades. Life has become more joyous as a result of this revolution. What he was saying, in essence, was that even though there were problems, there had been enormous waste and inefficiencies, that they had achieved a great deal. 
And, you know, he was right, certainly, by, by objective measures. There was strong economic growth in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. Um, now, it's very hard to track that growth accurately. Um, <laughs> different estimates, depending on who you ask, um, say that the, the economy grew anywhere between 60, 60, and 175% between 1928 and 1940. So that's a kind of big spread between 60 and 175 percent, right? But even if we take the most, the lowest numbers, the Soviet economy grew tremendously. Let's say 5 percent per year from 1928 to 1940. At the time, when the rest of the world was mired in a terrible depression and, and experienced almost no economic growth, if not negative growth, for much of that period. Okay, so there were there were some successes. There was definite economic growth, but there were many costs and unintended consequences. Costs borne by the population and unintended consequences that transformed Stalinism into something very different in many respects than what the government had intended. Um, one um, unintended consequence, certainly, was that it created what, what historian Moshe Lewin called a quicksand society. That is, uh, despite our vision of the Soviet Union, of the Stalinist Soviet Union as a totalitarian society, of one where people had little movement, had little freedom to move. In fact, people were moving all the time. Between 1928 and 1932 alone, 11 million or 12 million peasants left the countryside and went to the cities. So there's massive movement of people, major demographic shifts going on. And some of that the government liked because they wanted more workers uh, from their factories. But there were a lot of things that the regime did not like. Workers changed jobs constantly, moved around the country, took trains from place to place looking for better jobs. And, and so there was constant movement of people. It was extremely chaotic. Um, this was very much an unintended consequence of the way that they had carried out the Stalin Revolution. And the fact that the government found it impossible to control the flow of people in the way that they found that, in the way that they were comfortable. And that that play, will play an important role in, in terror, certainly. Um, the greatest cost of all of this, how industrialization was really paid for, was through shortages, essentially, through underproduction that, and, and suppressed consumption. That is, that if you're going to pay for tanks, and bombs, and airplanes, well, you're just not going to make many shoes. You're not going to produce enough food. You're not going to do all of those other things that people need. So there were, this became a society with an economy with systemic shortages of everything. This became a shortage economy. Indeed, this is something that, that lasts much longer than Stalinism, that lasts throughout the entire Soviet period. Um, the most obvious manifestation of these shortages was rationing, right? <coughs> rationing, which limited people's access to, to food and other consumer goods. Um, now, rationing of food is not an unusual thing in the 20th century, right? It wasn't an unusual thing in the first half of the 20th century by any means. All countries did it more or less. But they did it during wartime. Soviet Union did it during peacetime. We should tell you something, actually. That essentially the government felt it was in the state of war, even during peacetime. Against whom? Well, more or less their own population, or at least certain parts of, of their population. Uh, historian Alec Nove, in describing this, this, this first life of the plan period, said, quote, 1933 was the culmination of the most precipitous peacetime decline in living standards known in recorded history. So the industrialization was paid for by collapsing people's living standards. The last, but certainly not the least, outcome uh, consequence of the Stalin Revolution was the spectacular spread of mass terror against its own population. Now, Terror was not just an outcome of the Stalin Revolution. The Bolsheviks had long practiced terror. They always practiced terror. They were good modern revolutionaries, right? Revolutionaries tend to believe that the ends justify the means, right? That the goal for which you are striving is so great and so wonderful that it is worth it to do more or less anything, right? If it means shooting some people, well, that's necessary, right? And the Bolsheviks most definitely believed this. Okay? But unlike under Stalin, and unlike during the Stalin Revolution, the, the, the terror tended to be relatively limited. That is, 
I say relatively because we're talking about different orders of scale. We're talking about imprisoning, executing, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of people. Whereas under Stalin, you're talking about doing this to millions of people. Difference of scale, there's no question about that. Um, so how did this limited, targeted terror of the Bolsheviks practice uh, uh, routinely, I would say? become mass terror, become mass terror against its own population. Well, to put it in, I think, the most basic terms possible, um, things went wrong during the Stalin Revolution, right? Things went wrong. Things didn't turn out the way the government expected them to. Right? Things we've talked about, there were all these unintended consequences. And so much of terror had to do with what to do with scapegoats for the various problems, right? What do you do in the Stalingrad factory doesn't produce any tractors in the month of August 1930, for example, right? Or something something breaks down. There's some assembly line breaks down. You find a scapegoat, right? You find someone. It, it can't be because of the planning process, right? Because the planning process is rational. The planning process works. The, the, it's scientific. It's perfect, right? You can't, you can't, it's not our system that's wrong. It must be individual people who are somehow um, undermining it, okay? And so they look for enemies. Enemies who must be causing this kind of these kinds of uh, these kinds of problems throughout the country, and you know there were lots of enemies to, to look to look. There were enemies. It wasn't very hard for, for the Soviets to, to find enemies for, for to, to blame for these particular problems. Um, there were lots of people who had resisted the Bolsheviks all along, right? There were members of other political parties who had fought. There were peasants and kulaks who had resisted collectivization. Right? There were people who had said. Things against the government, other you know, negative things about the government. There were, all, there, there were plenty of enemies to go around. But what was even more, what was even what was even more important was that many of these enemies were hidden. Okay. That is, for Stalin and the other Soviet leaders, and indeed eventually for the society in general, you know, there was a fear of hidden enemies because of essentially the quicksand society we talked about. Not only were there enemies of the regime, but they could be anywhere, right? There were millions of people moving around the country from place to place. Where were these enemies? Maybe they'd infiltrated everything, right? They could be anywhere. And this, and this fear of enemies, of hidden enemies, becomes paranoia uh, on the part of, of Stalin and certainly of Soviet society in general, this fear of hidden enemies. And so increasingly, over the course of the 1930s, the, the NKVD, the, the secret police is told to go out and find these enemies, and deal with it. Okay. And this leads certainly to, I mean, I could spend a lot of time talking about terror and we'll spend more time discussing it with the sources, but um, the, the most notorious um, uh, incident of, of Soviet terror was the Great Terror of 1937 or 1938, or it's the Great Purge, Great Purge as they're sometimes called. Um, now, this was a time when Anxieties were at their height. Um, not only about problems within the country, but also about the international situation. Anxiety, especially about Nazi Germany. Right? This is a time when, when Hitler is, is extraordinarily popular in Nazi Germany. He's extending control. The Nazis are, 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 are swallowing up more territory. They're beginning to talk about, you know, they, they, and, and the Nazis constantly declared their intention to destroy the Soviet Union and kill all communists. It's one of their basic, his basic ideas. And so there's fear about this international war. And so in this context of, of enemies abroad, hidden enemies at home, the regime issues an, an order number 00447, okay, which is an order that, I, that, that you all read as, as part of the, the preparatory reading that we're going to talk about um, in the breakout session. You know, a very bureaucratic, Number is just a, num a numbered word that, that eventually results in um, the, the imprisonment and execution of over 1.6 million people. Uh, the order specifies what categories of people are to be arrested. It specifies that, that normal judicial procedures are to be suspended. They weren't very rigorous in the Soviet Union anyway. <laughs> But you know, the government, central government is suspending even those procedures 
what fit after very, very rapid results. And it results in approximately 1.6 billion victims in, in the period of more or less a year, or a year or two months. Uh, about half of which are, are executed in, in mass executions, including in mass graves all over the Soviet Union, and about half of whom are um, sentenced to eight to 10 years in Soviet prison camps in, in, in the Gulag. Now, traditionally, Historians have seen this as evidence of a strong state, as evidence of a totalitarian state, of a state that is flexing its muscles against its own population to try to, to cow them, to terrorize them. And, you know, there's certainly a lot of value in that particular judgment. But it's also important to note that terror was, was not just, was not necessarily a sign of strength. It was a sign of what the state desired to do, the strength it desired to have, but in many ways, it was a sign of weakness. Strong states don't have to go out and murder and imprison 1.6 million people in order, in order to feel they have control of it, right? Strong states legislate something. They, or they, 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 they arrest the people who are responsible for some particular problem. The Soviet state carried out what the reading called blind terror, right? blind terror in which they very well knew that they would be rounding up hundreds of thousands of innocent people uh, in order to accomplish their particular goal. And this really is how terror is, in this particular mass terror of 1937-1938, is related to the Stalin Revolution. Because essentially, you know, having unleashed these forces and attempted to transform their own country, and unhappy with the results, and unable to kind of control the results to the degree that they want, Terror becomes the order of the day. Indeed, mass terror becomes a hallmark um, characteristic of, of Stalinism. Okay, so here's my attempt to cram Stalinism into 45 minutes. I think I'm pretty much right on time. Um, so um, I'd like to put up a last slide um, of just some uh, resources or that might interest you as, as teachers uh, in, in how resources you can use in the classroom for the study of, of the Soviet Union. We'll open up to questions in a second. Um, the first one is uh, www.sovietisty.org, 17 Moments in Soviet History, which is a really remarkable website um, put together by a couple of uh, uh, Soviet specialists, uh, which breaks all of Soviet history into 17, uh, 17 key years. And it has subject headings for different things that happened at that time, and it has collections of primary documents to read, images, film clips, but also really helpful subject intros, just introductions to work with the subject at all. Um, I used it in my college classes, and, uh, and the readings are very short and accessible, and I think would be very, very useful for, for high school teaching as well. Um, you know, especially the kind of, it's, it's very rich in the kind of visual culture, visual images that you can use in classroom or have your students go and work, and work with. Um, the second one is a, is a site that I just recently discovered, uh, which is a digital library of Staliniana, which is basically everything having to do with Stalin. Um, images, artifacts, um, like all of those kinds of materials. It would be, you, know, you, could have, you could have your students kind of pick an artifact and write about it and, uh, and talk about it uh, particularly. The last one, um, uh, gulaghistory.org, is an online exhibit, um, which was an outgrowth of an of a exhibit that was actually at several national parks in this country, Gulag, Many Days, Many Lives. Uh, and it's about life, everyday life in the Gulag. Um, and this, this website is extremely rich. It has not only online exhibits that, that you, can, you can go through, but also an archive of images and documents and artifacts uh, that I think are, are extremely useful for, for teaching. Thank you.